This video has been supported by PCBWay. Hey guys, I'm preparing the Volvo for a little long road trip to Switzerland, where a viewer has offered me a very interesting but non-functional laser system. I think Volvo is going to survive. But this part of the video happened over two years ago during peak COVID, and I had no idea what crazy bureaucratic hindrances might await me at an international border crossing. To make matters worse, even if I made it through one way and everything would go according to plan there, I would have to return to the European Union afterwards with laser equipment that used to cost as much as a small house in my trunk. Surely that's not going to cause any taxation or customs issues, right? Oh well, there's no point in worrying, is there? Although I have at least an 8 hour drive ahead of me, with little else to do. Still, I love these luxury e-waste recycling missions. How about I attempt to explain what exactly has me excited enough to set sail for such a perilous journey? Lasers. Need I say more? <laughs> okay, so we're heading to a neuroscience institute at the University of Zurich. Not for treatment of a manic laser acquisition disorder, but to help a postdoc researcher with the disposal of some old broken equipment. What use have neuroscientists for fancy coherent light sources though? I mean, where I'm concerned, nobody has to justify an interest in shiny colorful toys or magic crystals. But I think here it's mostly about fluorescence microscopy. Instead of shining broadband light onto or through a sample, one can dye it and excite that dye with a specific light wavelength. That causes the dye to emit light on its own, which a scientist can capture as a much higher contrast image. Only the re-emitted energy and therefore wavelength will be a bit lower because a portion of the excitation energy is lost as heat. Unfortunately, samples usually have some thickness and transparency, which is why in wide field fluorescence microscopy, out of focus features will also show up and cause blurriness called background fluorescence. There is an extension to this method called confocal microscopy, where pinholes are used to excite only a small volume of the specimen and to strip away all out of focus fluorescence. Confocal microscopy is a fairly advanced technique already and it can yield fantastic results. It's a pointy process though and it takes a while to scan over samples at high resolution. Meanwhile, in order to reach deeply into a sample, the excitation is done with a fairly intense laser beam of a fairly high energy short wavelength so that the re-emission falls into a convenient band for imaging. And we all know, better than most, what happens when intense laser light touches anything, especially for a longer time. The sample can be damaged or the dye degraded, not only in the focal plane but also above and below. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could unlock yet another improvement for this light microscopy technology tree? Well, now that you mention it, this is exactly where the laser system that has lured me all the way down to Switzerland enters the story. If we can revive it, it will be able to compress laser radiation into ultra-short impulses. It may only have about a watt of average power, but compressed into less than 200 femtoseconds and focused into a small point, it can cause light intensities of mind-blowing and reality-shattering proportions. Well, reality has probably always worked this way, but it has only been confirmed in the 60s that at such high intensities a molecule, such as a dye or other interesting stuff, has a chance to be excited by two photons that arrive in close enough succession. If that happens, the molecule receives the energy of both photons, just as if it had absorbed a photon of twice the energy or wavelength. The implications for fluorescence microscopy are fantastic. We can now send ultra-short infrared impulses into a sample, which are least encumbered by biological tissues. Only in the focal point, deep within the sample, where the intensity is at its maximum, do two photon absorptions happen, as if there was blue, half-wavelength, twice-energy excitation light there. No photobleaching and much lower risk of sample damage elsewhere. Or we could trigger polymerization of UV-sensitive 3D printer resin, simply in the middle of a vat without repeated peeling and wasteful support structures. But let's not get ahead of ourselves too far. There are a few tricky problems in the way. A huge thank you to Fabian Vogt for the invitation and the materials to practically explore a small corner of his area of expertise in a few YouTube videos. He is now a Human Frontier Science Program Fellow and working at Harvard on leading edge neuroscience and imaging tools. He has also initiated an open source hardware light sheet microscope. 
making faster 3D imaging of cleared tissues available to scientists all over the world. I'll leave a couple of links to his work below if anybody has developed a taste for life science. Personally, I think I'm going to stick with e-waste recycling for the foreseeable future. My journey through customs and back home was blissfully uneventful. And so, finally, after five minutes of incoherent rambling, we can get to the point. This is the loot, a Myra 900 ultra-fast titanium sapphire tunable laser. And a Verdi V10 solid-state continuous wave green pump source. These two belong on an optical bench together, and then this baby is supposed to put out a few watts of spectrally pure green light to pump the magic crystal in the other box. Let's focus on this coherent Verdi V10 today. It is not happy. If I remember correctly, it was already destined to be scrapped before the neuroscience department adopted and revived it. Now it doesn't display anything anymore most of the time, and if it does, it's throwing its entire repertoire of error codes at me. Whoa, 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 take it easy with the exclamation marks, buddy. This is good, though. Electrical problems are the ones I can fix. It could also have damage to obscure optical components in the head. That would be more challenging. The head is attached to the control box with a thick umbilical cord. The manual goes through great lengths to explain that there's minimal bend radius for that. So I suppose there are optical fibers in there, maybe also cooling fluid? Oh, would you look at these huge fiber-coupled laser diodes. Coherent is calling them FAPs for obvious reasons, um, fiber array packages. And these are going to end pump a laser resonator in the head with lots of infrared power through fiber optical cables, thus generating the green output, somehow. They need very high currents in the order of 30 ampere each at roughly 1.7 forward voltage. So they receive lots of electrical power and convert less than half of that into light. The remaining waste heat has to be removed from these golden packages very effectively and precisely because they have significant temperature coefficients on output power and wavelength, both of which have to be super stable for optimal performance. So these are sitting on integrated Peltier modules, and those in turn are water-cooled. No cooling water seems to be routed down the umbilical cord. This coherent branded Thermotech water chiller that I got together with the lasers is a pretty fancy Peltier-based model too. It can stabilize its water temperature bidirectionally through heating and cooling. I kinda wish I had another one of those for my CNC spindle. Unfortunately, it seems to be infested with some strangely resilient form of algae that seems to thrive even in darkness and distilled water. Google thinks it's food. Who knows, maybe it can solve world hunger or feed generation starships. Or it's a dangerous escaped experiment from some neuroscience institute. Oh well, I'm not entirely opposed to having a world domination bioweapon live in my toilet. But I'll keep flushing and refilling the chiller with distilled water and a lacing of alcohol. Hopefully that'll put a stop to whatever is growing in there, lest I have to resort to UVC irradiation or something. Anyway, the two huge pumping diodes at Coherent Verdi's core need precisely controlled very high currents at very low voltages. The two separate thermoelectric coolers underneath them have similar requirements. And then there are at least two more Peltiers in the head for optical components. Meanwhile, the whole machine is powered by a single output 48 volt switching power supply. So a fairly high voltage. That means that there has to be some intense power conversion going on. And I feel like that is interesting enough to justify a closer look. After all, high power pumping diodes are occasionally available on eBay. And I'm still getting inquiries about my silly DC to DC converter based laser diode driver from way back in the day. Let's see if we can find out how it's done professionally. Maybe someone can put this arcane knowledge to good use. This is the center of power and the center of mass. Immediately it stands out how this board is built from functional blocks, a few of them similar to one another. The two biggest sections that take up the entire left half of the board are obviously the over 30 ampere constant current drivers. Then there are two smaller subcircuits which need these large toroidal inductors. If I had to guess, I'd say those are for the Peltiers underneath the pumping diodes, which mustn't be driven with a PWM output directly, but need some smoothing. There are more thermoelectric coolers in the head, but those don't need to be as powerful, so they don't stand out as much. I've started to reverse engineer what seemed to me like the most useful subcircuit. One of the two high current FAP drivers. 
I was able to get a general idea of what's going on on here. But what the designer is doing with his PWM driver IC is weird. And when I stumbled over this transistor with the base connected to the oscillator frequency programming capacitor pin, I knew I had to stop to prevent brain damage. So the control and feedback side is not complete all the way down to the last detail. But most importantly, this PWM controller drives these power MOSFETs alternatingly, sending the 48 volt back and forth through a custom DC to DC transformer. I would estimate a roughly 20 to 1 turn ratio in there, for a much lower output voltage with huge ampacity. Followed by rectification and smoothing, and that's basically it for this board. Then all the amperes leave through these gorgeous golden screw terminals, for a separate noise reduction circuit board. It took me a minute to figure out what this long orange component is. CCI might be the manufacturer circuit components that is no longer in business. Perhaps that's because they only printed their phone numbers on parts, instead of a unique identifier, so customers had a hard time reordering from them. <laughs> I don't know. But through systematic poking around I found out that this is actually a dual bus bar, that brings the high current from the other converter to the output terminals without needing excessive PCB traces. A part of the feedback for the central PWM controller I see is coming from what looks like an improvised current transformer. It's basically just two opposing wires carrying the incoming 48 volt to the transformer, passing through a many turn toroidal inductor. The resulting current signal is rectified, turned into a voltage, and then mingles with Coherent's own non standard implementation. Something important for a constant current source is missing though, did you notice? That little current transformer is only sensing impulses on the converter's primary side, for pulse shaping purposes, I suspect. Where are they hiding the precision shunt resistors that allow measurements and stabilization of the actual laser diode current? Hmm, I am beginning to suspect that there are none. Since the laser diodes are under strict temperature regulation anyway for their power and wavelength tempcos, their forward voltage per current should also be perfectly repeatable. So the FAPs are good current shunts on their own, just not very linear ones. So the processor might have to do some maths. Let's also check out this active noise reduction board that is working its magic directly on the two, possibly over 30 ampere currents that are passing through. Oh, cute. They are calling this the Verdi noise reduction piglet board. As far as I can tell, it's entirely optional for the operation of this machine. This active board only gets plus minus 12 volt supplies from elsewhere in the system. And I think a laser output power feedback signal via coax cable. Other than that, it only taps into the two 30 ampere lines at various points. For example, with another toroidal current transformer on the right. Or before and after the LC filtering on this passive board. Here, the two negatives go straight through from input terminals to output terminals unimpeded, assisted by two more of these SIP bus bars. The two positives are merged before being subjected to some more CLC filtering. Then they go through a combined current sensor and split off to the actual diode bars finally. The active board is fairly complex and thought through for how little influence it can swing. This dual op-amp U2 acts mostly on behalf of the coax input. I assume it takes control of these two transistors to smooth out ripples in the green output power. Meanwhile this quad op-amp looks at a few electrical parameters such as current sensor feedback or voltage drops over the LC filters. It has control over these transistors and tries to counteract the noise that it perceives. Yeah, couldn't help myself. Curiosity got the better of me. So this board uses the voltage at the combined positives as ground. And through PNP transistors it selectively allows small currents to flow from ground into the negative high current diode supplies. Astonishing. Under normal circumstances there should only ever be less than 2 volt between the two. And they are additionally limiting these correction currents with 20 ohm resistors. So maybe this board can swing a few tens of milliampere on a good day. That that should make a meaningful difference on top of the 30 ampere main drive really shows what a highly sensitive system this is. Here's what happens on TP3 if I mount an attack on one of the fiber optical cables. AC coupled by the way. The holiday season is approaching rapidly, and our sponsor PCBWay has bestowed upon us some early Christmas presents. Until December 31st, PCBWay's rapid prototyping services, such as circuit boards, assemblies, CNC machining or 3D printing, 
are available with substantial discounts and other festive advantages. Check out their Christmas 2023 landing page to find out more. I've been using PCBWay for many years. In doing so, I've accumulated quite a few beans on my account. Through this bonus point system, PCBWay sends out Christmas independent presents all year round. You can earn Bluetooth Tesla coil speakers, hand tools, USB power meters and other supplies passively by ordering something or by sharing your open source projects in the PCBWay community hub. This time, for the first time ever, I've tried their global parts sourcing and turnkey assembly service. I had them put together an open source DC to 10 MHz oscilloscope current clamp. The little B B1 by Weston Brown. PCBWay only needed the board Gerber files and a bill of materials. Then they did all the procuring and the assembly internally to deliver this powerful active probe to my door, nearly ready to go, without me lifting a finger. It may seem ludicrous to many of us, outsourcing the most enjoyable part of an electronic project. But not everybody out there has a fully stocked electronics workshop at their disposal, or the time or skill to use it. For those cases, PCBWay delivers yet another useful, affordable service. Merry Christmas! An oscilloscope current probe can cost many thousand dollars from the larger brands. So I'm quite excited to finally add one to my toolbox. The B2 is DC capable and has by far the lowest cost per megahertz. Without a ferrite core flux concentrator attachment, it can also be used as a general purpose magnetic field probe for diagnostics and EMI pre-compliance testing. But enough doodling around, let's try and revive this thing at long last. Just behind the front panel lives a CPU card. And I get a feeling that somebody has already tried their luck on it. It was not plugged in all the way. There is an artisan test point on the ADC. And a jumper link is already placed over JP9. Unlocking the dangerous, not so secret service menu. Besides interboard connections, the motherboard has only one function I think. It keeps a little sealed LED acid battery charged. Presumably through this fuse which was open circuit. When the laser is powered down, a microcontroller on here takes control of a crystal heater in the head and very slowly and gently ramps down the temperature of the most important optical component in the system, the LBO, instead of letting it freefall and crash to ambient temperature, which could damage it or at least change its properties such that a lengthy retuning might be necessary. Hmm, I wonder if an LTZ1000 could also benefit from such a system. I replaced the blown fuse, a shorted tantalum cap, and the battery, which was too far gone for revival. I also 3D printed a new bezel for and replaced this keyless key switch with something a little bit more usable. I briefly appreciated the fact that the coherent engineers had prepared themselves a cozy little prototyping area in here. Love it. And we are in. Can't say for certain what did it. I think the shorted tantalum capacitor was only interfering with the battery backup subsystem. But I haven't seen another blank display start since and that's good. Of course, in keeping with the same thermal shock precaution, our special crystal can only be brought up to its operating temperature of around 150 C very slowly. So we have a moment to ponder the advanced service menu. Servo status is kind of an overview of all the control loops like temperatures or laser power. Laser status is an overview of the whole device. It can tell you, for example, if heat is extracted correctly from the pumping diodes or the head base plate. We have no reported faults at the moment, which I doubt, but always good to be optimistic. Temperature set points is a tool that displays the green laser output power, if any. Together with, you guessed it, temperature set points. It lets you make temporary changes to try and eke out half a percent of efficiency somewhere. I think LBO settings only lets you initiate the lengthy controlled cooling while still under mains power without relying on the battery. LBO optimization is a 4 hour auto tuning program that tries to maximize the infrared to green conversion efficiency by testing a range of LBO temperatures in the neighborhood of 150 C. The next few temperature servo settings all work the same. 
They are for fine-tuning the control loops and to set in which range they can be considered locked. Etalon captures a brief blinking out of the pumping diodes, which can recenter the resonator frequency. We'll talk more nonsense about LBOs, Etalons and Vanadates in a minute, don't you worry. With diode current delta you can force a small asymmetry onto the diode's power supplies to try and compensate for other imbalances in the system. Here I'm going to switch to current control mode, which lets me command with that power adjust knob on the right how many ampere are going to be squeezed through the diodes, as opposed to the default arrangement of me commanding how many watts of output power I want, and the Verdi trying to deliver that based on a built-in power sensor, which should be right there in the head just behind the brightly illuminated warning sign. Um, okay, I think it's time to get out of the way, lest we are pew pewed out of existence in a moment. Yep, that's my small contribution to optimism today. But no, we are not quite there yet, it seems. Even at 30 ampere through each diode, the built-in power sensor sees nothing. We are not even getting total camera sensor annihilation when looking straight into the aperture. Just a vague pink glow, which is its interpretation of infrared. So this is a tricky situation. A lot of things could cause this lack of pew pew. First and foremost, I guess that LBO crystal, whose conversion efficiency according to the manual can vary by 50% per degree Celsius. Whew, that thing is much more sensitive than an LTZ1000. Hope they have a good 13k 1k voltage divider in here. But when I swept through the allowed crystal temperature range slowly, I never even got a small hint of green. It could also be a damaged fiber optical cable. The umbilical cord's armor was slightly crushed at one point. But the bundles are still well protected underneath, and it's all very resistant to bending. Someone really has to have malicious intentions to damage that. Before taking the risk of disassembling any other sensitive components, I wanted this naive test to show me if I was getting roughly similar output powers out of the FAPs at roughly equal current. In retrospect, this is not a good test. At 8.6 ampere, the lasing threshold of these diodes is just around the corner. I should have done this at over 11 ampere and with a laser power meter. But uh, how should I say it, I was very lucky. I misinterpreted the technically plausible difference I saw at this low current, as a clear sign of Fiber Array Package 2 being unwell. This mistake made me take a closer look though, and it ended up leading me in the right direction. We hardly need the power meter to confirm the gigantic difference in infrared output power between diode 1 and 2. At 15 ampere, diode 2 gives us 150 milliwatt. Meanwhile, diode 1 is off the charts, so over 3 watt. I could literally feel it on my skin. So that is unfortunately a faulty or worn out fiber array package. What? Why does it sound so hollow? Seems like the lid is just glued on, rather than this whole thing being milled out of a solid gold ingot. Whoa, what a scam. I thought these would be full to the top with diode bars, copper mirrors and beam combiner optics. But I'm okay with this. These smaller packages are very popular and readily available on eBay all the time. Turns out I even have another old broken DPSS laser based on a small coherent fab right here in my waiting room. Unfortunately, its diode is even less healthy than the one we just diagnosed, so I won't get around waiting for a proper eBay replacement part. In the meantime, let's poke our noses into and get a taste of the last few remaining secrets that Coherent Verdi has to offer. The fab is pretty mundane, at least from my ignorant perspective. They glued a perfectly spaced bundle of fibers onto a piece of ceramic and then soldered that with indium metal onto a thermally conductive pedestal to point every fiber perfectly into the diode bar, which in turn is clamped on top of a solid copper pedestal. To keep this maybe not optimal but at least operational as per datasheet spec over a wide temperature range of minus 20 to plus 30 degrees C, there has to be some advanced thermal expansion coefficient material matching going on. If one of these is ever not cooled sufficiently and it reaches the indium melting point near 150 celsius, it's pretty much game over right away. No built-in power sensor or ESD protection in these, pretty simple. Unlike this next part, which is the opposite of simple. I'm not even sure if I should. This is a very valuable piece of kit, even when still broken. And even more so because I have plans for it in future videos. 
But I've looked up in advance what crystals to expect in here and what properties those might have. None of them seemed hygroscopic, and anyway, there are flat flex cables penetrating the O-ring seal. So this assembly is nowhere near hermetically sealed, merely dust proof. I'm going to hurry up, get the shot, and get back out before the dust can settle. That's how that works, right? So these are the terminated fiber optical cables coming in from the FAPS, delivering their 808 nanometer payload. This one makes a U-turn through prisms, so that both can end pump this neodymium doped yttrium autovanidate crystal. Everybody just calls him vanidate. It doesn't look like it's doing much because the incoming 808 nanometer that excite the neodymium ions look the same on film as the 1064 nanometer that are re-emitted when the ions return to their ground state. But it is in fact performing the first out of two wavelength conversions in this cavity, and in doing so it improves the spectral purity of the dirty diode's output a little bit. The re-emission is going to exit that crystal coaxially with the excitation beams. So in front of and behind it there are dichroic mirrors, highly reflective to 1064 nanometer, and this is actually where the kind of ring laser begins. The 1064 nanometer output that encounters this mirror is redirected into this component, the lithium triborate crystal, the mythical LBO that we've heard so much about. If it's in the mood and in its thermal comfort zone, and if some phase matched photons coincide, it will do its job as the second harmonic generation crystal, allowing two photon absorptions not too different from the ones I mentioned earlier in this video to take place within it. And that's how a large portion of the light with 1064 nanometer wavelength can be converted into light with exactly half of that wavelength, 532 nanometer. And there we are already. That is the beautiful green narrow line width low noise output that we were after. The successfully converted green light can pass through this dichroic mirror, gets power measured and sent off to the output aperture. The unlucky leftovers who haven't found a face matched partner are still infrared and get reflected by that dichroic mirror to be recycled. They have to go through this optical one way valve, about which I might talk your ears off in the next desktop fiber laser engraver video. And then through a precisely temperature controlled etalon, another opportunity for a lengthy Asperger's fueled monologue. Let's call it a filter for now that rejects everything but 1064 nanometer. The leftovers go back to our old friend Vanadate and start the journey anew. One concern that one might raise is that Vanadate kind of has two outputs. It could laze in what we know is the wrong direction and waste half of its power heating up the optical one-way valve. Luckily the recycling mechanism slightly favors unidirectional operation and as far as I understand it there is a kind of peer pressure among photons that causes near perfect unidirectional operation and negligible losses in the optical isolator. You have selected Microsoft Sam as the computer's default voice. Yeah, sounds like the head would be running the show pretty efficiently. It kind of is to be honest, but it's a smallish device that needs to dissipate more heat in operation than it can passively. So while I don't have a nice metallic optical bench, I'm going to put it on these cooling aggregates which should do the job. Meanwhile my replacement eBay fab has arrived. I went with the cheapest one for 80 bucks and it looks the part. I was confident but not completely sure that it would make a difference. So I didn't want to commit to a big investment. For similar reasons I also didn't buy new indium foil as thermal interface material. But that was a mistake. Turns out Coherent uses 20 bucks worth of precious metal foil for a reason. Their diode packages actually have a pretty rough surface finish. So direct metal to metal contact would not work well. I applied what I thought was a high performance thermal interface material between the new FAP and its Peltier base. That led to a whopping 15 degree C temperature delta between the two. Basically I created a large current dependent temperature variable in the system that isn't even seen by any sensor and neither by me at first. So that created some weird confusing behavior immediately after the swap, but I remembered an old skill from my teenager computer tuning phase. Never thought I'd have to lap a fab someday. To make up for the missing height and allow for a stress-free installation of the fab into its surroundings, I made a hopefully superbly thermally conductive 0.2mm copper shim. Or is it just an excuse to show off this new toy? Perhaps. I don't think I've achieved atomically perfect surfaces here, that are at risk of cold welding at the next best opportunity. So I've applied a small amount of thermal compound too. 
to spread that out nice and evenly, I'm trying to apply equal mounting pressure over crosswise. With a compliant thermal interface material such as indium foil, this would absolutely be the most crucial step. With flattish metal surfaces and a bit of paste, oh well, it can't hurt. What matters is that after installing Pumping Diode 2 on this shim, I started seeing negligible temperature differences, so mission accomplished and no delicious indium wasted. And then, with minimal servo loop fine-tuning, I finally saw the green glimmer of hope, the auspicious emerald dawn that I had hoped for all this time. And more than that, actually, I tried a little bit of temperature optimization. But it's kind of a six-dimensional problem with many possible solutions. And every parameter change needs a while to settle down and take effect. On this day, I ended up reaching something between 7 and 8 watt green output power. But beyond that, the control loop starts running away to excessive currents, while the output power only keeps falling. That might simply require better fine-tuning, or there might still be a subtle hardware problem somewhere. We'll figure it out. This is all I could have asked for for now. 7 watts of green light is impressive and scary. Scary because human eyes tend to have a sensitivity peak at green wavelengths. So it's rather noticeable how much 7 watt of power is and how much of my room it illuminates. Meanwhile, the fiber laser engraver from a minute ago can put out nearly 10 times as many watts. Only of the invisible variety, but just as unfriendly to our retinas. Soon above Rapslabs HQ, one small trick that pilots and law enforcement don't want you to know. As hypothesized earlier, diode currents in the system might be estimated based on their forward voltage drops. After dropping in a new diode and giving it a new temperature setpoint, it seems like a good idea to perform a voltage and current calibration. It may look strange adjusting this stately imposing laser system to the second cheapest clamp meter in Bryman's portfolio. I'm not concerned. BM078 has been perfectly reliable down to the least significant digit. And here's the next confirmation. It agrees perfectly with what original diode 1 has been adjusted to. As expected, the new fab could do with a bit of tweaking, which I'll accept and memorize here. Actually, I think the pump parameters are stored separately, in EPROMs on little personality boards. Those don't seem rewritable from within the menu, and the changes will be forgotten with a power cycle. With this adjustment done and pump currents now equal, I was able to beat my output power record yet again. Holy moly, bet I could also beat Darth Vader with this thing. <laughs> That'll give the nosy neighbors something to stew over too. Love it. There seems to be a bit of gain error in the built-in photocell power sensor, based on which Verdi tries to adjust its output power. Maybe that is why it still can't make it all the way to 10? It aims too high, fails, and then tries to make up for it with excessive diode currents? Not sure, but this runaway behavior near max output power persists. So I think I'll try to adjust that photocell next. However, this might also be a sign that something is still not quite right. According to the Verdi user manual, these photocells that supervise the pumping powers should only be at 2.5 volt at their maximum power. So maybe we do have some abnormal losses in the cavity. But this is the end of the video. I'm calling it a success because this can't be argued with. Huge thanks again to everybody, Fabian, Eric, Ibi, Rowan and Wheelectron. See you soon with mode locking, I hope.